This video starts us off on the exploration of standard number three called duties to clients. Specifically, this is 3A, uh, loyalty, prudence and care. It's a very important standard. Uh, please expect to be tested on it one way or another. Um, most of the time, these questions are fairly easy, but you need to understand some of the wording and the context. Okay, let's Let's start off with the requirements and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into some more specific contextual um, details. So, um, CFA Institute members and also candidates in the pro program um, have a duty of loyalty to clients. Loyalty to their clients. Um, what else? We must act with reasonable care, must act with reasonable care, and we also must, well, okay, must um, exercise prudent judgment, exercise prudent uh, judgment. Now, the degree to which um, this is the case will typically depend on the nature of the relationship. If you're a client advisor, you have a different uh, set of responsibilities than if you're just a, you know, um, somebody handling transactions. Um, nevertheless, what the standard does is that it sets a sort of minimum benchmark which then needs to be applied in the context of the specific um, relationship with the client. Now, whatever, whoever you are, you must always act for the benefit of your client. Um, and a lot of the examples, a lot of the questions are uh, devoted to identifying who the real client is. Also, you must place your client's interests above or uh, before the interests of your employer, so the company you work for, uh, plus your own interests as well, right? Which is the which is which just shows you how how tough the standard is. So important. This is a minimum benchmark, right? Um, in specific relationships, there may be other standards or other rules that apply which may, you know, be more specific. That's ex especially the case if you're an advisor, uh, a portfolio manager, where you have what's known as fiduciary duties. Um, but uh, the standard doesn't go into that as such, right? Now, let's focus on identifying the actual client because you know the client is at the center of all this so I, let's identify the actual client who they are now a lot of the time this will be easy because the client may be the person whose portfolio you are managing or who you are advising and that person hired you to do so but in a sort of typical uh, CFA Institute question on this topic what you what will happen is you're a manager and you're, you're running or managing a portfolio uh, uh, for a pension fund or maybe some kind of trust. And of course, you know, you, you've been hired by someone to do, you know, uh, some, somebody's commissioned you to do so, somebody's you pa paying you a fee, uh, but Ultimately, what you need to understand is that this pension fund of this trust has uh, beneficiaries and ultimately you owe a duty of loyalty to them. So people who you may never meet, um, who actually don't directly pay you anything, but indirectly it is them who, who you are working for. Uh, not the person who's hired you, uh, and you may have to sometimes go against their wishes. Uh, and there are some very nice examples of that in the um, in the subsequent sort of section with with uh, with little uh, case studies and examples there that we'll talk about. Now another big theme here is something called soft commissions. 
or soft commission policy policies. Um, this idea of soft commission is also known as um, soft dollars. And once again, plenty of question, questions on this or examples of this. Um, very often, if you are um, managing somebody else's wealth, uh, managing other people's money, um, you will, well, you'll need to trade, you'll need to buy and sell securities, and you get to choose um, a broker. You know, which broker do you use to buy and sell, to trade? So the context is such that the manager of the portfolio of assets often has uh, discretion over broker selection and the broker is who kind of executes your transactions. Now when choosing the broker uh, or when doing this uh, the manager must always seek so manager must seek the best price uh, obviously the lowest price when they're trying to buy the highest price when they're attempting to sell but also uh, what's called best execution and best execution is not about just the speed of the execution but also um, just very holistically or comprehensively maximizing maximizing the value um, of the client's portfolio. Now, what happens in a lot of the questions is somebody uh, uses the services, a portfolio manager uses the services of a specific broker because they get something in return, but something that doesn't add value to the client, it adds value to the portfolio manager, like preferential rates on their own transactions. And that's absolutely, a, you know, that's something that's a violation of the standard. But a, a lot of the time, what will also happen is because you're using a specific broker or the manager is using a specific broker you get and that's what soft commission and soft dollars is about you get access uh, to research services so various research um, reports for example done by the broker and the broker's staff and the question is should you be directing trades that broker and therefore kind of using the what they call using the client's commission after all ultimately it's the client who pays for the for these trades so so you have to judge whether it's justified to use a specific broker um in the sense that uh, uh, is the, is the research that you're getting really benefiting the client and obviously, um, that has to be evaluated. Um, it's, it, it would be a violation of the standard if you were directing client trades towards a specific broker who was charging a slightly higher price, or just a higher price, but giving you something in return, some research, if you deemed that the value of that research is not high enough to justify the higher brokerage costs. Now, I'm not saying it's always going to be a, um, you know, a decision to reject this. Uh, it will not always be a violation because sometimes what you're getting, those, you know, uh, that research may be very valuable for the client who's ultimately sponsoring it. But very often in the CFA questions, uh, it will be a, a clear-cut case that that is not happening. Now, sometimes your client may actually say, you know, please use the services of this specific broker. So client may specify a, you know, a broker of their own choice, and we call that directed uh, brokerage. And I mean, you can't argue with the client in the sense that it's their money, and if they want to trade via specific, you know, their, their, their portfolio to be traded via a specific broker, let them do so. But if you think that uh, they're not getting the best price and execution, please, you know, absolutely disclose it and make your client known. Uh, you still 
owe it, you know, duty of loyalty to the client, and you, tr you should seek their best interest. Okay, another uh, thing is proxy voting. You know, this is what typically happens during the annual general meeting of shareholders. And if you're a portfolio manager um, holding some shares of a company, you will um, be invited to cast a vote uh, on various company matters, like executive compensation. So as a portfolio manager, um, you know, get to vote. And that's called uh, proxy voting, because you're kind of voting on behalf of your, um, of your, of your clients. And please appreciate that most of the time, um, the voting actually has value for the client. I mean, it's one of the ra rights contained in, um, in, in ordinary shares that you get to vote. And that's a valuable right. So as a, as, a, as a manager, you must act in such a way as to maximize uh, value, must maximize uh, value for the client. And therefore, you know, treat the treat the voting seriously. Vote in um, a responsible and informed way. Analyze what you think is best from the client's perspective. Don't just vote automatically, unless a specific vote doesn't justify too much, you know, attention and research. There's also, you know, a kind of cost-benefit trade-off to to consider here. Now, in terms of recommended procedures, there really isn't anything interesting here. At least I haven't found it. So I'm going to cut this section short because I don't want to bore you. And, you know, my job is to also dissect um, the curriculum so that you can ultimately save time. Um, the, the sort of the three big themes, and there are a bit, you know, quite a few more details, but are to provide regular account information to your clients. So let, you know, report to clients about their assets, where those assets are held, etc. Um, if you are ever uncertain what the client would like you to do, I mean, once again, this is in the context of managing somebody's money, get the client's approval, obtain client approval. Uh, if you're not sure, just get in touch with them, get their consent for something, like how, how would they like to vote on a specific matter. And, you know, it, when working for a larger firm, make sure that firm policies, so policies within the company, cover all of these uh, points, um, like, you know, proxy voting or how to, um, how to use the client's commission, um, in terms of broker selection and additional services, identifying the actual client, that kind of thing. Uh, make sure that everybody's on the same page with regard to these topics. Now, for the examples, um, let me tell you that I find that examples one to seven are extremely important. Absolutely read them focus on the, you know, think about them and focus on the answers and the explanations given. A lot of them, uh, you know, for example, the first one, it's brilliant. It's about identifying the client. And uh, that that's absolutely important. Um, a lot of them are about client commission and potential failure to identify uh, or obtain, sorry, that best price and execution thing that we've been talking about in different contexts, really informative. I mean, uh, absolutely something that you may expect to get on the exam. And I find number seven especially important because it focuses on family members. And please do that one. Try to come to your own conclusions. But it's family members with a twist, not what you may it may surprise you. I'm not, you know, do it first um, and then read the explanation. The explanation is fairly straightforward, uh, but I'm not going to spoil it for you. It, but, but do pay attention to it. Um, 
the subsequent examples 8, 9 and 10 are not as important as those first seven, but nevertheless, let's read them, but they don't add so much to the discussion anymore.